Well, shalom, everyone. This is Evangelist August Rosado with Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries. And we want to thank you so much for tuning in on this Thursday afternoon. And, of course, we are coming to you live from our main headquarters here in Lincoln, Rhode Island. It's pretty uh, rainy today, but it seems like it's cleared up, a little damp out there. And so uh, we are just so excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedule and join us on this Thursday afternoon. It's been cooling off out here in the New England area, and uh, fall is definitely in the air. But I am I'm so thrilled that we can come to you Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday as we look at current world events in light of biblical prophecy. And so I know that I see many of you coming into the room right now like our dear sister, Deborah Stanfield Ross. She's a big supporter of this ministry, uh, loves the Lord, loves Israel. And uh, we appreciate Deborah out of Louisiana. And uh, good afternoon to you. And of course, my dear friend from Dallas, Texas, Dr. Todd Baker. And come this Monday, I will be accompanying Dr. Todd Baker, to the Holy Land. We are going to Israel come this Monday. And Dr. Baker and I, as usual, will be going out there and evangelizing and sharing the gospel with the Jewish people. And I am so looking forward once again to going back to the Holy Land, going back to Eretz Israel, that's Hebrew for the land of Israel, and looking forward to sharing the good news with the Jews. And we are going to distribute those complete Hebrew Bibles. And of course, Todd Baker has that long hey on there. And so, Todd, hey yourself. I'll be calling you later. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait either, Todd. I cannot wait to be back in the Holy Land. And so I'll be seeing Todd come Monday night. Him and I are going to just have some great fellowship. And uh, it's not as if him and I do this every day, you know, because he lives in Dallas. I live way up here north in Rhode Island. So we're pretty much worlds apart, at least, what, maybe 2,000 miles apart or so. But, uh, you know, but we will uh, get together come Monday, and then we're going to fly off to Eretz Israel. And we will be in Israel for uh, 11 days. And I'm just really looking forward to doing what Yeshua did 2,000 years ago. What he said in Matthew 10, 6, Matthew 15, 24. I go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And uh, as you know, folks, you know, we, we need your help with this. Now, yeah, my, my airfare is paid for, my, car, and my uh, hotels are paid for, and the food and all that. But we need help with car rental expense. We need help with gasoline. Gas is very pricey in Israel. And so if you feel led by the Lord to help give toward the car rental and toward gas expense so that Todd and I can drive around Israel distributing those complete Hebrew Bibles. When I say complete Hebrew Bibles, I'm talking Old and New Testament in Ivrit, Hebrew. And if you can help us out with that, for all of you that are watching, if you can help us out with that, whether you're watching live or you're watching this archive later, if you can help us out, that would be greatly appreciated. You say, August, how can I do that? All you simply need to do is go to my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. Scroll down to the bottom of the page, and you'll see the PayPal button. Hit that PayPal button, and then put whatever amount you feel the Lord's leading you to give. And all you got to do is put in the uh, box, 48th Israel Gospel Outreach. That's all you need to put in there. 48th Israel Gospel Outreach. Put the amount in there that you want to give, and that will come right to us. <clears throat> we will make sure that goes for car rental and the gas expense out there in Israel. We'll be giving you live updates next week from the Holy Land. So, again, if you feel led, pray about giving. 
for the 48th Israel Gospel Outreach. Dave Vandervin, good to see you, brother. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we're going to be talking about the Olivet Discourse, part two. So I hope you have your Bibles ready. Take a pen and paper, write notes down. It's good to take notes. You know, when you, that's another way to get information into your cerebellum here. You activate your touch gate by writing notes. You activate your eye gate by reading. You activate your touch gate by writing. And so that is a great way to get information. And I like repeating things. You know why? Repetition is good. The more you say it, the more it's going to sink in there and you won't forget it. And so invite a friend and have them tune into this broadcast. We'll be on again tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But this week, it's crunch time. And I'll be leaving for Israel come Monday. And, you know, the adventure begins, not when I get to Israel. The adventure begins when I get on that plane in Boston, fly down to New York, and then from New York to Tel Aviv. So the, the, the adventure, that's when the adventure begins. And I cannot wait to go soul winning in the Holy Land. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. We're going out there to ful fulfill that great commission of Mark 16, 15, when Yeshua said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that is the job, not just for the pastor. It's the job for everyone in the church. Brother Jeff Bass has joined us. Ashley Wade Thurman is in the room with us. Many of you are coming into the room right now. We appreciate that. And so, again, um, I sent out a newsletter last night. And if you didn't get that newsletter, if you don't subscribe to our newsletters, you can do that by going to my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. Hit the contact August Rosado form. Give me your name and your email address. Send that to us. We'll put you in the database so that you can start receiving our newsletters. They go out every single week. We also sent out an appeal newsletter yesterday that is on my Facebook timeline. And, of course, it says Yeshua on the top of the uh, old city of Jerusalem in the background. And I made the appeal for those to help me out financially with car rental and gas expense in Israel. Believe me, Dr. Todd Baker and I are not going to Israel to go touring. We're not going to be sitting down on a lawn chair in front of a pool sipping pina coladas. We're not going there to tour, folks. We're going there to evangelize. We're going there to share the gospel. As we have done, as all of you know, if you know us, many times in the past. So we're not asking for finances so that we can enjoy a, a pleasurable time out there. We're asking for your financial help to help us to drive to these shopping malls in Tel Aviv, in Netanya, in Tiberias, in Nazareth, and Jerusalem. As Todd and I go into these shopping malls and we share the gospel with the Jewish people and with the Arabs as well. We're going to have Bibles out there waiting for us at our hotel when we get there. These complete Hebrew Bibles, Old and New Testament. And then the moment Todd and I land in Tel Aviv, one in the afternoon, on September the 17th, we're not going to drive in the town and go right to our hotel. We're going to the Dizengoff Mall in Tel Aviv, Israel. And we're going in there. And we're sharing the gospel. And so, again, we, we can really use your help with that. So, again, if you want to help us out, whatever gift, there's no gift too big or too small to go to a car rental and gas expense out there in Israel. Everything else is paid for. I don't need help with anything else. I don't need help with airfare. I don't need help with hotels. I don't need help with food. That's all covered. 
We just need the car rental and the gas expense. That's it. So whether you get 15, 20, 25, 30, $50, whatever, that will go exactly toward the car rental and for the fuel out there in Israel. If you love the Jewish people, if you love Israel, and if you want to see the gospel taken to them as Jesus did 2,000 years ago in Matthew 10, 6, Paul in Romans 1, 16, to the Jew first, he said, and also to the Greek and the Gentile. If you have a burden for the Jewish people, then please help us out with that. Paul said in Romans 10, 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And that's why Dr. Baker and I are going out there to Israel. So please pray about supporting us. Again, go to my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. Hit the PayPal button at the very bottom of my webpage. And then, again, just put 48th Israel Gospel Outreach. Put in the amount you feel you want to give, and then hit the send there. It'll go right to our PayPal. Or you can mail any of your support to Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries, 55 Pleasant Street, Apartment 2, Lincoln, Rhode Island, 02865. Well, on another note, last night I visited some friends at a church in Cumberland, Rhode Island, about 18 minutes from where we live here. And, uh, of course, my wife Patty's watching. She's in the room there. Please pray for her. She's still a little bit weak in the arm after she had that bad fall. And so I'll just uh, keep Patty in prayer. I really would appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for that. So we went to this church, our ch uh, friends of our church yesterday, and um, went in, sat down, enjoyed a great time of fellowship there. Blackstone Valley Baptist Church. At the end of the service, of course, my dear friend, Pastor Lewis, his wife presented my wife a check for $150. See, so that's not a lot of money. That's a blessing right there. We weren't expecting that going over there to this church. Gave my wife a check for $150 and just said, use this for whatever you want to use it on. So that was a real blessing. We weren't expecting that. But then I was informed yesterday by Pastor Lewis, his wife, two other women in that church that they're signing up to go to Israel with me in March of 2020. I'm like, Baruch Hashem, blessed be the name. So I'm like, wow. It's... This is amazing. We got so many people calling me up, wanting to go with me on my Bible prophecy tour to Israel in March. And we just added Mount Nebo on this tour. All my trips to Israel, all my trips to Jordan, South Jordan and Petra, but I've never been to Northern Jordan. I'm on Jordan. I've never been to Mount Nebo. That's where Moses viewed the promised land, looking down on the, the Jordan Valley from Mount Nebo in Jordan. And so, without any price increase, we've added Mount Nebo. So, it's Israel plus Jordan, Mount Nebo in the north, and Petra in the south. So, I'm excited about that. We want you to come to Israel with us. March of 2020, allow me to teach you Bible prophecy on location. If you want more information about this trip, it's going to be about 3550 Per person, all inclusive. That includes your round trip airfare, hotels, food, transportation, Israel, and Jordan. So it's thirty-five fifty per person, all inclusive. If you want more information, see me at you know. See, I keep saying this a lot. I'm so used to saying this in churches. See me at the end of the service. No, contact me at the end of this broadcast through Facebook Messenger. If you want to give me a, a phone number, I'll call you back. You're not going to get a secretary. You'll get me. And I'll try to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, Todd, that's a really good price. It's a very, very good price. And so um, I, I really hope that you would pray about coming to Israel with me and my wife in March of 2020. I believe the dates will be. March 2nd to the 13th. And we have to make it early in March. You know why? I got to go back to Israel <laughs> with Todd Baker again. <laughs> so, so him and I can once again evangelize the Jewish people. So not only is Todd Baker and I going 
Monday, this Monday, to Israel, but we were just approved by Zola Levitt Ministries to go back to Israel this December to evangelize the Jewish people. And Todd already made the arrangements for him and I to go back to Israel in March. It's a blessing when you can go to the Holy Land some four times a year. And, uh, and one of them being tours. I lead the tour over there. And so if you want to go to Israel, then, you know, contact me, and I'll let you know exactly what you need to do. We'll, we'll even send you a, a, uh, an attachment brochure of this trip. It's going to be a trip of a lifetime. I want to take between 18 and 20 people with me. And so we like, we like small tours. I don't like these big, large tours. I just don't. I like to make it personal for everybody and teach you Bible prophecy on location. You'll never read that Bible the same way again. This Sunday, I'm going to be preaching at God's Grace Bible Church in Millbury, Massachusetts. I'll be teaching in Sunday school and preaching their Sunday morning service only. There will be no evening service. I'll just be there for the morning. Bob Picard is the pastor, and I am looking forward to me back with the people. I've been there many times. And they called me and said, hey, would you come back and preach before you leave for Israel? I said, absolutely. So we will be at God's Grace Bible Church, Millbury, Massachusetts, come this Sunday. And then Monday, off to Eretz Israel, off to the land of Israel. I am so excited about this. Then when I get back to Israel, I'm only going to be home for one day. Then I have to get on a plane, fly down to Orlando, Florida to meet all of my family. We're having a family get together out there uh, at Orlando, uh, Disney World. And so my daughters, my grandkids, uh, all of our family is going to be there. And so they want us to go there as well. So I told them that we'd, be, we'd go down there. And um, I'm going there just for the sake of being with my family because I love my family. I love my daughters, my grandkids. I love my family. So uh, I'm looking forward to just being there with my family and enjoying time with my grandkids and just, just seeing them having a good time and seeing them have fun out there. So uh, the Lord's been keeping us very, very, very busy. I noticed that my dear friend, my former pastor, Dr. Jeff Amsbaugh, Pastor Amsbaugh, Heritage Baptist Church in Virginia, is also watching, and um, he may be out there at Heritage, but I still refer to him as my long-distance pastor. So hope you don't mind, Dr. Amsbaugh. So, <laughs> but uh, great to have Pastor Amsbaugh in the room with us today. And uh, Danny Ehler Jr., thank you so much for tuning in as well. All right, enough of the infomercials. I want us to get into the Word of God. But again, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you, I hope you do, please. Have your Bibles when you come into the room. I want you to open to Matthew 24. I want you to look at verses 5, 11, and 24. Matthew 24, 5, 11, and 24. And, of course, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Mashiach. That's Hebrew for Messiah. I am Christ. And shall deceive many. In verse number 11, Jesus said, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Verse 24, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very <clears throat> elect. So we're going to look at part two of the Olivet Discourse. So we continue our study here in Matthew chapter number 24 concerning the Olivet Discourse. As Jesus is on the east side of the city of Jerusalem, on where? The Mount of Olives. That's why we call this the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, facing Jerusalem from the east. And being on the Mount of Olives in the east, they're straightway looking at the Har Harbayat. That's Hebrew for the Temple Mount. 
where the Beit HaMikdash or the second Jewish temple stood, Herod's temple, before the Romans destroyed it in 70 AD. Jesus' target audience in Matthew 24 are not Gentiles, the Goyim in Hebrew, but his target audience is the Jewish people. Concerning what? Well, concerning the events of the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, or a.k.a. the seven-year period of tribulation. We'll never hear that phrase. The 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, it's always referring to that final week of seven years. Daniel 9, 24 through 27 covers the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. 69 of those 70 weeks have already literally been fulfilled, leaving one week left unfulfilled. That would be that future seven-year period of tribulation. Let me also remind everyone here today, there is no mention of the church or Christians in Matthew chapter number 24, because the church, as I said, was not in the 69th week, and that would be from 445 B.C. up to about 30 A.D., 483 prophetical years based on the Jewish lunar calendar, based on the moon. You can't fit those numbers into the calendar that we use today. The, Gre the Gregorian solar calendar, which is based on the sun. You can't fit those numbers in Daniel into our calendar. But it fits beautifully into the Jewish lunar calendar based on the moon. Our calendar is based on the sun. The Jews are in the Jewish year 5779. We're in the year 2019. Again, our calendar is based on the sun. The Jews' calendar based on the moon. Church was not in the 69th week. That 483-year period, or 173,880 days from Nehemiah 2 to the crucifixion of the Mashiach, the Messiah, in Daniel 9, 26. The church wasn't in the 69th week, and the church will definitely not be in the future 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. I challenge anyone to try to fit the church into the 69th week period. You can't do it. And I guarantee you, you can't put the church in the 70th week either. Why? Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. <clears throat> Who's Jacob? Genesis 32, 28. Israel. Daniel 9, 24. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. Well, who's thy people? He ain't talking about Christians. He's not talking about the church. Who's thy people? The Jews. How do I know that? He says, thy people in thy holy city. You think he's talking about Providence, Rhode Island? You think he's talking about Washington, D.C.? Obviously, he's talking about the city of Yerushalayim. He's talking about the city of Jerusalem. Matthew 24 deals with the tribulation period. Matthew 25 deals with the kingdom. Please keep that in mind. Matthew 24 deals with the tribulation. Matthew 25 deals with the kingdom. Matthew 24 has been seriously misinterpreted. You know why? Because of Western mind thinking. Thinking, that's it. Western mind thinking. As I said yesterday in our last study, the reader must dismiss his or her Western mindset and read the Bible in its original Jewish setting. And folks, when we fail to do this, not only are we not getting the whole picture, but we're not going to get the right hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is the science of biblical interpretation. Who's speaking? Who's he speaking to? What is he speaking about? And the problem with many in the church today is we read these prophecies with a Western mindset, 
and then we give it our own Western interpretation, and <clears throat> we come up with the wrong hermeneutic. If you take the text out of context, you end up with a pretext. You're only going to get half the picture. We are in the gap of time between the 69th and the 70th week. The gap of time being the church age. <clears throat> Excuse me. The gap of time being the church age. Like I said yesterday, we are between that gap of time between the two mountains. The two mountains being the Olivet Discourse on the Mount of Olives and the great mountain that will one day fill the whole earth. Well, that's out of Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. Daniel said, I saw a stone that smote the image, and that stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Well, what does that mean? Well, that great mountain in the future will be the millennial kingdom. Jesus is the stone who will smoke that image. And then that stone becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. The Davidic theocratic rule of Jesus emanating from Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom as earth's capital at that time. The Olivet Discourse was given by Jesus, Yeshua, 2,000 years ago. Again, the great mountain is the millennial kingdom that will fill the whole earth according to the Jewish prophet Daniel. Jesus is that stone. And that stone will one day strike the ten toes of the revived Roman Empire. The ten toes spoken of in Daniel chapter 7, verses 8, 20, 24. The ten toes spoken of 500 years later by John in the book of Revelation. Chapter 12, verse 3, 13, 1. Chapter 17, verses 3, 7, 12, 16. That final ten nation revived Roman Empire. One day Jesus, the stone, will strike those ten toes, destroy the revived Roman Empire, destroy the Antichrist, and the stone becomes a mountain and will fill the whole earth in the millennial kingdom reign. Well, that's out of Isaiah 11, 9. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters, Maim in Hebrew, as the waters cover the sea. Matthew 24 must be read in its Jewish context. And no other interpretation should be applied to it. Again, let me reiterate. I told you repetition is good. Matthew 24, it has nothing to do with Christians. And it has nothing to do with the church. But it has everything to do with Israel in the final 70th week of prophecy. Now, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 5, Jesus talks about false messiahs and false teachers who will come on the scene claiming to be him. Over the years, folks, we have had many people claiming to be the Lord Jesus. In verse number 11, he talks about false prophets that will arise and deceive many. How can you tell a false prophet from a true prophet? Deuteronomy 18, 19 through 22. If a prophet comes on the scene and he claims something's going to happen down the road on a specific day, and if that event doesn't happen, based on Deuteronomy 18, you label them a false prophet. And when you look at Christian TV today, I guarantee you there are a lot of false prophets on Christian TV, a lot of false prophets on Christian radio. If you're going to watch Christian TV or Christian radio by stars, folks, you need to put on your spiritual ears, man. You need to be careful who you watch and what type of doctrine they're given. So in verse 11, he talks about false prophets that will arise and deceive many. In verse 24, Jesus uh, talks about false prophets 
They'll even show signs and wonders. Jesus said, if it were possible, Jesus didn't say possible. He said, if it were possible, that they would deceive even the very elect. Well, who's the elect here? That's another thing that's been misinterpreted, especially by those in Reformed theology. <clears throat> they say, well, the elect are those who have been called to salvation while the rest of the world is going to go to hell in the handbasket. God has already chosen who he wanted to be saved, and he's already chosen who he wants to go to hell. Well, then that would contradict 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but all, A-L-L, -L, all should come to repentance. What's the August Rosado definition of all? All means all. And that's all. All means. I believe in a whosoever gospel. Jesus' atonement isn't limited. It's unlimited. 1 John 2.22. God gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, the saved, but also for the sins of the world, the unsaved. <clears throat> he died. For the sins of all mankind. Salvation is uh, sufficient for all, but efficient for those who call upon him to get saved. Again, salvation is sufficient for all, but efficient for those who call upon the name of the Lord <clears throat> and get saved. So he talks about these false prophets showing great signs and wonders. The Antichrist and the false prophet will do that. In the tribulation period, call and fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. And the Bible says, and will deceive the world. So these false miracles that we see going on right now, they're planting the seeds. They're sowing the seeds for the ultimate deceiver from the revived Roman Empire to come on the scene. So Jesus said, if it were possible, not possible, if it were possible, that they would deceive the very elect. Who's the elect? Those in the tribulation period. The elect would be Israel. Oh, wait a minute now, brother. Is out now. I know you're not teaching good doctrine. Wait a minute. Israel is called God's elect. How do I know that? I read the word of God. Isaiah 45.4. God says, Israel is my elect. Isaiah 65, 9, Israel is my elect. Isaiah 65, 22, Israel is my elect. Israel is called God's elect. This has nothing to do with the election to salvation as these reformed guys in Calvinism are trying to teach today. That's false doctrine. Listen, you have the national election of Israel and you have the ecclesiastical election of the church. Neither supersedes the other. Let me say that again. You have the national election of Israel and the ecclesiastical election of the church. Neither supersedes the other. Israel has not replaced the church, and the church has not replaced Israel. We here at Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries outright reject replacement theology or supersessionism. We reject it outright. The world today, they're looking for the three M's, M as in M and M. The world today is looking for the three M's, the New Age movement. The New Agers are looking for Maitreya. They're looking for Maitreya to usher in a new age of enlightenment. So we're looking for Maitreya, according to the New Agers. The Muslims are looking for the Mahdi, 
Who is the Mahdi? Well, according to them, the Mahdi will come and he will bring in a global Islamic caliphate, an Islamic global kingdom, if you will. And when he comes, he will convert the whole world to Islam. The Jews are looking for the Messiah, the Mashiach, who will usher in a theocratic kingdom to come, emanated from the holy city of Jerusalem. So the world today looks for the three M's. <clears throat> in um, Matthew 24, verse 6, Jesus talks about wars and rumors of wars. Now, folks, you know human history has seen 4,535 wars. That resulted, by the way, in over 600 million men killed. We're talking over the centuries. But the wars that Jesus refers to will compass that number. The wars that he's talking about in the 70th week, they'll be unprecedented. Parallel to Matthew 24 is Revelation chapter 6 with the opening of the seal judgments. Who opens the seal judgments? None other than the Lord Jesus himself. Because all seven years of the tribulation period is the wrath of God. Not the wrath of man. Not the wrath of Satan. All seven years is the wrath of God. The pre-wrath rapture position is false doctrine. Because they say that the first three and a half years is the wrath of man, one-fourth of the last three and a half years is the wrath of Satan, and then the rest of it, maybe a year and a half, is the wrath of God. Baloney. All seven years are the wrath of God. Revelation 6, 16 and 17. The men of the earth are hiding in the caves and under the rocks, calling upon the caves and the rocks to hide us. From the face of him that sits on the throne, God the Father, and from the wrath of the Lamb, God the Son. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? This is the opening of the seal judgments here. And who opens the seals? Revelation 6, 1. I saw when the Lamb opened the seals. The Lamb is the Lord Jesus. He opens all seven seals. And by the way, that results in one-fourth of humanity being wiped out. The trumpet judgments, where do they come from? Man, Satan, Revelation 8, 2 says, I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And when those trumpets blow or shofars, that's going to result in another one-third of humanity perishing. And then when we get to the vial or the bold judgments, in chapter 16, the Bible doesn't give me a number as to how many died. But in Revelation 16, too, it says, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. <clears throat> These guys like pulling verses and, and manipulating passages to make it fit their eschatology. So the opening of the seal judgments in verse number 8, with the opening of the fourth seal, that will result and one-fourth of humanity killed. One and a half billion people. That's with a B, as in boy. One and a half billion people. And then the trumpet judgments, Revelation 9.15, Revelation 9.18, another one-third of humanity is killed. Another one and a half billion people. So just between the seal and the trumpet judgments alone, about three and a half billion billion people are wiped out. Far beyond the 600 million of all those 4,535 wars that, that were fought over the centuries. Between the seals and the trumpet judgments, close to three and a half to maybe even four billion people. In Matthew 24, 15, Jesus refers to the abomination of desolation. So, Jesus quotes from Daniel 9, 27 about the Antichrist confirming the covenant with many, the Jews, 
for one week. What is that one week? That's their final 70th week. That's that final seven-year period of tribulation. The guy who's on uh, TV who pre or teaches a post, or Irvin Baxter, teaches a post-tribulation rapture. And he says, there's no such thing as seven years of tribulation. It's only three and a half years of tribulation. Well, again, he's teaching false doctrine. He even made the absurd statement, Irvin Baxter Jr., that right now he's building a school in Jerusalem, and then it, during the tribulation period, he's going to go to Jerusalem to his school <clears throat> where he's going to preach for that three and a half years and have all the Jews come to him so that he can preach the truth to them during the three and a half years of tribulation. He doesn't believe in a seven-year period. Of tribulation. So he says the week in Daniel 9 27 is not the seven years, it's three and a half years. I can prove to you right now that he's wrong. Just a simple reading of Genesis 29 27. When Jacob is working for his uncle Laban, he works seven years, but instead of getting Rachel, he gets Leah. So he got conned by Uncle Laban. So Uncle Laban said, If you want Rachel, you're gonna have to fulfill her week and work yet another seven years he uses the word week in genesis 29 27 and then qualifies it with seven years the same hebrew word shavua in genesis 29 27 is the same hebrew word in daniel 9 27 and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week but in the midst of the week, he shall perform the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even till the consummation. And that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. The final week, Antichrist confirms that peace treaty with Israel. That will kick off day one of that 2,520-day countdown, leading up to the revelation or the second coming. Of Jesus back to this earth. Remember, those numbers you cannot fit into our Christian Gregorian solar calendar. It doesn't fit. Showing it has nothing to do with Christians and nothing to do with the church. But those numbers fit beautifully into, uh, into the Jewish soul, uh, excuse me, the Jewish lunar calendar based on the moon. Because their calendar is a 360-day year calendar. The tribulation period is seven years long. So if we take 360 on the Jewish calendar times seven, we come up with 2,520. How long is 2,520 days? Seven years. And if we take the 2,520 divided by two, we come up with a number found in Revelation 11.3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. And it shall prophesy... 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. 1,260 days, the first half of the tribulation period. And then when we get to Revelation 13, 5, the Antichrist will continue 40 in two months, the last half of the tribulation period. 42 months is 1,260 days. If we only do our homework, we wouldn't get so doctrinally messed up when it comes to eschatology and come up with all this baloney of mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath, partial rapture, oh, it's nonsense. Just absolute nonsense. You need to look at the scriptures for their plain sense interpretation. You let the Bible interpret the Bible. It's as simple as that. That is the science of hermeneutics, the science of biblical interpretation. Jesus quotes out of Daniel 9, 27. And not only that, he confirms that the Jewish prophet Daniel authored that book, because you got these liberal theologians today that are saying Daniel did not author the book of Daniel, somebody else did. Jesus confirms Daniel wrote it in Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. And I'll tell you another thing. These hyper-preterists today who... Claim that all the events in the book of Daniel 
and the book of Revelation were already fulfilled. They were fulfilled in the year 70 AD. There, there is no future eschatology to look forward to. And many of these hyperpreterists would say that Antiochus IV Epiphanes fulfilled the abomination of desolation in Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 27, and that he uh, fulfilled it in 165 B.C. That's not true. They said, well, yeah, it's true because Antiochus went into the temple in Jerusalem, offered a soul or pig on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. That fulfilled the abomination of desolation in Daniel 9.27. You know, even the Jewish historian, Josephus Flavius, believed that Antiochus himself fulfilled that prophecy in Daniel 9.27. But Jesus, who foretold the abomination of desolation 200 years after what Antiochus Epiphanes did in 165 B.C., Jesus still puts it in the future. 200 years after Antiochus IV Epiphanes. So it wasn't already fulfilled in 165 B.C. Jesus still puts it in the future in Matthew 24, 15, 200 years after Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes. So when the Antichrist defiles the third temple in Jerusalem, and he puts a cessation to animal sacrifice, and he proclaims to the world that he is God. That's the abomination of desolation. And Paul talked about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. He said, let no man deceive you by any means. Jesus said that, now Paul is saying it. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except to come and fall away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple, that's the eschatological temple, the tribulation temple, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said, Those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. In other words, those who survive the tribulation period refuse to worship the beast. They refuse to take the mark of the beast. And they survive the tribulation period. They'll go into the millennial kingdom in natural physical bodies. They endured to the end. The same shall be saved. But when we get to verse 22 of Matthew 24, the Lord said, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. What does, he, what does he mean there? In other words, the last half of the tribulation period, the 42 months of Revelation 13, 5, the 1,200 and 16 days, Revelation 12, 6, the times, time, dividing of time, Daniel 7, 25, times, times, and half a time, Daniel 12, 11, times, times, and half a time, uh, Revelation 12, 14. That's how the Bible breaks it down, folks. If Jesus did not return by the space of 1,260 days, by the space of 42 months, the last half of the tribulation period, if he did not shorten it to 1,260 days, no, there not, would not be one single survivor on the face of the earth. That's how bad this tribulation period is going to be in the future. The last half of the tribulation period is limited to 1,260 days. And if it was not limited, to 1,260 days, no flesh would survive. And by the way, you would have no one in physical bodies to populate the millennial kingdom. All you will have in the millennial kingdom are those in glorified bodies who were raptured seven years earlier before the tribulation period. Nobody would be there in physical bodies if Jesus did not return by the space of three and a half years. 
1,260 days or 42 months. And this is the reason why you have so many theological holes in the post-tribulation rapture view. The post-tribulation rapture view is a perversion of eschatology because it has a church going through the whole seven-year period of tribulation period getting beat up. And then at the end of the tribulation period, the church is raptured. At the end of the tribulation period, according to the post-trib, the church goes up in the rapture at the end of the 70th week and then immediately comes back down, up, down, in which I call the yo-yo rapture. And if that was the case, if the post-tribulation rapture was true, then you would have nobody in physical bodies to populate the millennial kingdom. All you would have are those in glorified bodies there. Nobody in physical bodies, which proves the post-tribulation rapture is a perversion and it is false doctrine. In Matthew 24, 30 and 31, Jesus returns at his second coming. And what happens? He sends his angels to sever the just from the unjust. Now, who are the just? The wheat? Who are the unjust? The tares? Again, it's out of Matthew 24, 30, and 31. And then, of course, you got the good and the bad fish. That's Matthew 13, 47, and 48. Jesus talks about grabbing the fish with the net, taking the good fish, and discarding the bad fish. He comes to sever the wicked from among the just at the end of the tribulation period. That's Matthew 13, 49. <clears throat> at the rapture, believers are taken and unbelievers are left behind. But it's the reverse at the end of the 70th week. At the second coming, unbelievers are taken off the earth. And believers in natural bodies are left on the earth in the flesh to go into the inauguration of the millennial kingdom. And that's the reason why the post-tribulation rapture makes no sense whatsoever. Why? Spiritualize, allegorize, manipulate. That's what they do. They take scripture, they allegorize or spiritualize it, they'll manipulate it to make it fit their doctrine. And where are these unbelievers going? Where, what happens to the tares? The bad fish, if you will. Or in Matthew 25, those that have no oil in their lamps. Talk about unsaved Jews, by the way. Well, Matthew 24, 50, says they're cast into outer darkness, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And they will be in hell and will remain in hell until they stand before Jesus at the great white throne judgment. And then at the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20, 14 and 15 tells us they'll be cast into the lake of fire. That would be their final destination. Now Jesus ends the Olivet Discourse in verse 51 by asking the disciples this question, have ye understood all these things? And that's what I want to ask everyone in the church. Have you understood all these things? When you look at the scriptures for their plain sense interpretation, allowing the Bible to interpret the Bible, applying inductive Bible study, using parallel passage, uh, passages in order to ascertain more information. Do ye understand all these things? I told you already, folks, when I teach and preach Bible prophecy at churches all over the country, I tell people up front, don't expect any YouTube eschatology from me. Don't expect eschatology conspiracies from me. You will only get the plain sense interpretation of Scripture. That's it, just like you got today. No hype, no drama, no sensationalism. And pastor, if I come to your church, that's exactly what you're going to get from me. You know, there are many signs in the tribulation 
period, that are evident, but there are no signs that precede the rapture of the church. There are no prophecies that must be fulfilled before Jesus returns, <clears throat> excuse me, at the rapture. No prophecies have to be fulfilled at all. We must never, and again I reiterate, we must never set dates for the rapture or think something has to happen before the rapture takes place. The rapture, this is an imminent and signless event that could happen at any moment, at any time. That is our blessed hope. The blessed hope of Titus 2.13. The post-tribulation rapture guys will say, oh, you got no blessed hope to look forward to. You're getting beat up in the tribulation period. Well, if that's the case, why did Jesus say, let not your heart be troubled? John 14.1. Or why would Paul say in the great rapture passage of 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Comfort one another with these words. If we're going through the tribulation period, <clears throat> there's nothing comforting about that, and your heart better be troubled. But Titus 2.13 says we ought to be looking for that blessed hope. Bible tells you nowhere in the New Testament to look for the Antichrist. Nowhere. But tells you on many occasions to look for Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May I reiterate again, get rid of that Western mindset and read the Bible in its original Jewish setting. I'm not saying, oh, you need to familiarize yourself with the Hebrew. No, no, no. You need to read it in its original Jewish setting. Who's the target audience? What is the event all about? Where did this take place? What city are there in? That is hermeneutics. That is the science of biblical interpretation. Who's speaking? Who's he speaking to? What is he speaking about? Context, context, context. Don't take one Bible verse and base doctrine on that and say, this is what it means. Context, ladies and gentlemen, context. And you allow the scriptures to interpret the scriptures. So many Christians out there, especially these guys that are teaching Bible prophecy or trying to teach Bible prophecy, get so doctrinally messed up that they're not helping the people that continue to confuse them even more. I'm not saying I have all the answers, folks. I, I'm like you. I'm a student of Bible prophecy. I've studied the subject for 31 years. But I, I allow the Holy Spirit of God to help me understand the right hermeneutic. So what do I do? I study the word of God for its plain sense interpretation. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. It doesn't need my help. It doesn't need your help either. The word of God stands on its own. You know, I want to recommend two books to you in dealing with Matthew 24. And this one I talked about yesterday by the late Noah Hutchinson. It's called Understanding Problem Prophetic Passages, Volume 1, The All of That Discourse. Not a big book at all. I think it's maybe about 95 pages or so in here. Another book that I highly recommend by the late Rennie Showers, Dr. Renald Showers, who was my Bible college professor when I was at the Institute of Biblical Studies in New Jersey at the Friends of Israel, the sign of his coming, understanding the Olivet Discourse. You can order these books from my ministry. And uh, this first book right here uh, is uh, $15 plus $3 shipping and handling. And this one here, $15 plus $3 shipping and handling. <clears throat> and if you order... Both books will let you have them for $25 plus um, $4 shipping and handling. All you got to do is go to my website, <clears throat> todayinbibleprophecy.org, hit the PayPal button at the bottom of the page, and just pull up Olivet Discourse Books. That's all you need to pull up, Olivet Discourse Books. $25 plus 
plus $4 shipping and handling. And we'll make sure that we get those books out to you. Great books to have that help you better understand a passage that has just been sorely misunderstood and misinterpreted by many of those in the church today. And so I hope and pray that this uh, lesson was a blessing to you. I know that many of you are uh, in the room right now. <clears throat> uh, verba for Dupis said, I asked questions during the study that rattled the teacher. And, and you know, Verba, it's always good to ask questions. I don't like it when someone tries to trip me up or uh, is being a smart aleck with their questions because that's just a big disservice to God. And it's sin and it's disobedience when we're trying to trip somebody up with a question. That's just that's just disobedience. And it's not pleasing to God. But it's good to ask Bible prophecy questions. So, you know, I don't know what rattled uh, the teacher, you know, but, you know, we need to do what 1 Peter 3.15 says, to be ready, to be always ready to give an answer. Um, Verba says, I uh, just visited an Adventist church. They believe in a post-tribulation rapture. Sister Verba, if I may say, find yourself another church to go to. I consider Seventh-day Adventists a cult. The number one fact is not really because they believe in a post-tribulation rapture. There are many Christians out there that believe in a post-tribulation uh, <clears throat> rapture. The fact of the matter is they say that Christians who worship on Sunday will take the mark of the beast in the tribulation period. I'm yet to find a Bible passage for that. And I refer to them as fake Sabbath keepers. They're Gentiles. The Sabbath was exclusively given to the Jewish people and the Jewish people alone according to Exodus chapter 20. God did not give the Sabbath to anybody else in the word of God. And there is nowhere in the New Testament where the church is commanded to keep the Sabbath. Nowhere. Paul talks about the total opposite in Colossians 2.16. Paul says, don't let anybody judge you concerning the Sabbath or what type of food you eat or, or, or what you drink or in respect to a holy day. So the Bible says, you are persuaded on what day you want to worship. We don't worship a day, we worship a person, whether it's on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday for that matter. We don't worship a day. We worship the Lord Jesus. So there are many other things I can talk about, the seven-day Adventists, but in my estimation, they're a cult. Um, Sue says, I never connected Leah's week with seven years. I always thought Jacob got Rachel only uh, after only a week, but had to work seven years. Thanks, August. Well, yeah, he worked seven years, Sue, and he thought he was going to get Rachel, but instead he got Leah. So he had to work another seven years, in which Uncle Laban told him, if you want Rachel, fulfill her week in which you have to work yet another seven years. Again, that's out of Genesis 29 and verse number 27. Great to see uh, Danny Edwards. And, and again, Verba, thank you for being there. Uh, Billy Turner, good friend of mine. Uh, Jeremy Baker, good to see you, brother. Hey, Sue Bloom, great to see you here. God bless you, sister. And uh, Mike Thurman, a dear friend of mine, evangelist out there in... Uh, Indiana is uh, with us. And so, uh, again, guys, I hope you join us tomorrow afternoon for another Bible prophecy update. And so, again, this Monday I'm leaving for Israel with my friend Dr. Todd Baker, and we're going out there to evangelize the Jewish people. And, again, uh, I don't need financial help with hotels or airfare. Or food, that's all paid for. Well, what I do need financial help with is for car rental and gas expense. That's it. If you have a burden to see the gospel go to the Jewish people, please help us out with whatever amount you feel the Lord's telling you to give. It can be $10, $15, $5, $20, $25, $50. Say, August, how can I help reach the Jewish people with the gospel? Go to my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org, scroll down to the bottom of the page, click 
PayPal button and just put 48th Israel Gospel Outreach. Put whatever amount you feel the Lord's telling you to give and send that to us. And that's going to go toward the car rental and gas expenses. Your gas is very pricey in the Holy Land. The Arabs won't sell it to the Jews, so they get it through secondary means. So if you can help us out with that, you will have a hand in helping us reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, Sar El Tours is providing the Bibles for us, the complete Hebrew Bibles. They'll be waiting for us right there at our hotel in Antonia when we get there on the 17th. And we're going to go right to Dizengoff Mall in Tel Aviv and pass out those Bibles and share the gospel with the Jews. So we can really use your help financially for the car rental and the gas expense. I don't need help with anything else. So if you can help out with that, please pray about what the Lord would have you to give. And you will have a hand with Todd Baker and I in reaching the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right? You see Glenn Hawkinson uh, with us. So good to see you, brother. And if you want to come to Israel with me in March of 2020, I can't believe the people that are calling me saying, August, we want to sign up to go to Israel with you in March of 2020. And as I said in the, uh, earlier before the broadcast, we just added Mount Nebo in northern Jordan. That's where Moses viewed the promised land and, would, and died and was buried. And it was right there from Mount Nebo, he looked down into Israel, looking at the Jordan Valley. Wasn't allowed to go in, though. And we're going to go to Mount Nebo without any tour price increase. Mount Nebo, northern Jordan, and then we'll go to Petra, southern Jordan. And then, of course, Israel. So Israel and Jordan, 11 days in the Holy Land. And I think the price is going to be about $35.50 per person, all-inclusive. And that will include your round-trip airfare, hotels, buffet, breakfast, and dinner daily, transportation, Israel, and Jordan. So if you want to come to Israel with me next year, March of 2020, make those preparations now. Get a hold of me as soon as possible through Facebook Messenger, and I'll tell you exactly what you need to do. Well, hope to see you tomorrow afternoon, Lord willing, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And remember, keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we will see you, Lord willing, tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, and God bless you all. See you then.